गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू ज्ञान चैनल द टॉपिक फॉर टूडेज क्लास इज मीडिया एंड सोसाइटी इन दिस वी विल बी अंडरस्टैंडिंग अबाउट द रोल ऑफ मीडिया इन सोसाइटी मास सोसाइटी एंड मीडिया ऑडियंसेस पर्सपेक्टिव ऑन मीडिया इफेक्ट प्रो सोशल वर्सेज एंटी सोशल मीडिया इकोलॉजी एंड लास्टली द कल्चरल स्टडीज ऑफ स्टूअर्ट हॉल so let's begin the class uh, genuine we know the mass society theory is a complex multifaceted perspective as applied to social movements however basic idea is that people who are socially isolated are especially vulnerable to the appeals of extremist movements the theory resonated with fears of fascist and communist movements in 1930s and 1940s and reached its apogee in late 1950s ideologically the concept of mass society has been used by conservative thinkers to express dismay about leveling tendencies of industrial society and the declining influence of family and community this was said by singwood in 1977 an important ideology sociological predecessor is emile Darkheim analysis of modern society and the rise of individualism with increasing size and complexity social integration became problematic in two ways anomy involves insufficient regulation of behavior while egoism involves excessive individualization of people both signify weakened social integration and loosen social controls and contribute to dysfunctional outcomes including suicide this was said by darkheim 1987 and the quote by blumer blumer 1951 is that the mass was one type of collective behavior subsequently identified by the chicago school of society alongside crowds publics and social movements masses are distinguished the large size anonymous nature loose organization and infrequent interaction she right mills in 1956 acknowledged the dangers in his analysis of power elite it gained power in part because of the transformation of public enjoying democratic dialogue and political influence into masses with neither with the transformation of public into masses at the end of the road there is totalitarian as in nazi germany or in communist russia it was in the context that william cosconer trained in chicago school of society wrote the politics of mass society in 1959 it remains one of the most explicit statements of the alleged link between mass society and social movements written in the shadow of aforementioned totalitarian tendencies mass society theory sought to explain the rise of extremism abroad and the dangers of democracy at home recalling darkheim's analysis of egoism and anomy mass society emerges when small local groups and networks decline leaving powerful elite and massive bureaucracies on one side and isolated individuals on the other as corn hauser wrote mass society is objectively the automated society and subjectively the alienated population mass society is one where both elites and non elite lack social insertion that is when elites are accessible to direct intervention by non elites and when non elites are available for direct mobilization by elites in a healthy pluralist democracy both elites and non elites are partially insulated intermediate groups are strong and normal channels of influence are robust in mass society both groups lose this insulation insulation intermediate social buffers buffers erode normal channels are ineffective or bypassed and extremism becomes more likely mass movements pursue remote extreme objectives and mobilize uprooted atomized people thus mass movements mobilize people who are alienated from the going system who do not believe in the 
legitimacy of the established order and who therefore are large, ready to engage in efforts to destroy it. This description of mass movements reflects the collective behavior depiction of mass behavior with a remote focus of attention, a declining sense of reality and responsibility, and a highly unstable shifting focus of attention and intensity of response. Subsequent analysis of and research have led many to in conclude that the idea that the most socially isolated are most likely to engage in mass politics is most certainly false. Those who are socially isolated are actually less likely to join while those who are embedded in pre-existing social ties are disproportionately likely to do so. Chicago School Sociologist Turner and Kellyan themselves note that the second study of totalitarian movements has raised serious questions about the applicability of Korhasar's concept of mass movement. Other researchers concur that virtually all of the major claims of the theory have been controverted by an overwhelming body of evidence. Despite its largely discredited status among academics, literary and journalistic proponents of this perspective enjoy a much wider and perhaps more credulous audience. As a result, mass society theory proves well nigh indestructible despite its logical flaws and imperial shortcomings. Now we discuss about perspectives of media effects pro-social versus anti-social. Prospective media for children in the early days of television, the limited offerings of the network featured many family-friendly pro-social programs. Through the 1970s and early 1980s, content analysis revealed that children's favorite programs often featured portrayals of empathy, altruism, and an exploration of feelings. Networks soon discovered, however, that more money could be made on so-called program-length commercials, cartoons that were mainly vehicles for selling toys such as action figures. As a consequence, pro-social television declined through the 1980s and mid-1990s. How do pro-social media affect youth? Researchers who study children's pro-social learning from media typically work under the assumption that characters who behave kindly, cooperatively, responsibly, and altruistically are providing models that children can learn from and subsequently intimate, imitate. Much of this research is grounded in Bandura's social cognitive theory, which originally explored how televised aggression might be imitated under certain conditions, but has also looked at pro-social behavior that might result from media exposure. Generally speaking, the mechanism goes like this. Children observe a character behave in a positive manner that behavior is more likely to be imitated if the character is realistic. It is similar to the child, receives positive reinforcement and carries out an action that is imitable by the child. Pro-social content may also be providing children with skills for dealing with their emotions and managing their moods. As noted at the beginning of the chapter, children are born with temperament but look to the environment to learn emotional competencies. For example, ways to feel better about themselves to or get through a bad day. A third Potential mechanism underlying the relationship between media content and pro-social behavior may be that social, pro-social content offers children scripts for dealing with unfamiliar situations. According to a schema or a script theory, a schema is an organized structure of knowledge about a topic or event that is stored in memory and helps a person assimilate new information. Schema theory suggests that people possess schema for emotions which include information about facial expressions, the cause of feelings, and the appropriate ways of expressing feelings. Children use schemas to help them interpret what they encounter in the media. Intermedia content can contribute to a child's schemas. 
Cultivation theory has found that over time heavy TV views tend to adopt belief about the world that are consistent with television's portrayal of the world. In other words, children who watch a lot of TV featuring crime or hospitals may also see the world as, a, as many as a scary place. Research suggests that child audiences can recognize the feelings of media characters, though it appears that younger children are less likely to experience the character's feelings than older children. In one society, 3 to 5 year olds and 9 to 11 year olds watched a scary movie film clip. For one group, a threatening stimulus was shown. Other older children were more frightened and psychologically aroused than the younger children, though all children recognize the character as frightened. Then we discuss about media ecology and Marshall McLuhan. The medium is the message. McLuhan's theory of media ecology is best captured in his famous aphorism, the medium is the message. We are accustomed to thinking of the message as separate from the medium itself. The medium delivers the message. McLuhan, however, collapsed the distinction between message and the medium. He saw them as one and the same. The challenge of media ecology. Any understanding of social and cultural change is impossible without a knowledge of the way media work as environments. But evaluating the ecology of media is a difficult enterprise because all environments are inherently intangible and interrelated. Invisibility of environments, McLuhan was fond of quoting the mantra of anthropologists. We don't know who discovered water, but we are pretty sure it was under the face. McLuhan's theory of media differs from the traditional warnings against technological advances. The tales of Frankenstein, Blade Runner, Jurassic Park, and the Marxist posit technology gone every and turning to its maker. These fantastical threats prove terribly obvious. As long as our technologies are not changing after us, we are supposedly safe from consequences of our creations. Accordingly, to, according to Mike Lohan, it is not technological abnormally that demands our attention since it's hard not to notice and the new and the different. Instead, we need to focus on our everyday experience of technology. A medium saves us because we partake of it over and over until it becomes an extension of ourselves. Because every medium emphasizes different senses and encourages different habits, engaging a medium day after day conditions the senses to make in some stimuli and not register others. A medium that emphasizes the ear over the eye alters the ratios of sense perception. Like a blind man who begins to develop a heightened sense of hearing, society is shaped in accordance with the dominant medium of the day. Now discuss about a media analysis of human history. McLuhan divided all human history into four periods or epochs, a tribal age, a literal age, a print age, and an electric age. According to McLuhan, the crucial inventions that changed life on its planet were phonetic alphabet, the printing press, and the telegraph. In each case, the word was ranged from one era into the next because of new developments in media technology. Those of us born in the 20th century are living through one of those turbulent transitions from the tail end of the print age to the very beginning of the electronic age. Now we discuss about the tribal age. An acoustic place in history according to McLuhan, the tribal village was an acoustic place where the sense of hearing, touch, taste and smell were developed far beyond the ability to visualize. In untamed settings, hearing is more valuable than seeing because it allows us to more immediately aware of your surroundings. With sight, we are limited to direction and distance. We can only sense what is clearly in front of us. If a praying animal is behind us or hidden behind a tree, we are hopelessly unaware about a sensibility to sound or a smell. 
hearing and smelling provide a sense of that which we can't see a crucial ability in the tribal age the spoken word is primarily a communal experience to tell a secret we must whisper or speak directly in someone's ear or make sure that no one else is listening next is the age of literacy a visual point of view turning sounds into visual objects radically altered the symbolic environment suddenly the eye became the higher apparent uh, hearing dismissed diminished the uh, value of quality to disagree with this assessment merely illustrates macwan believe that a private left brain point of view becomes possible in a world that encourages the visual practice of reading text next is the printage prototype of industrial revolution the phonetic alphabet made visual dependence possible the printing press made it widespread in the gutenberg galaxy maclohan agreed that the most literacy age a visual era a time of private attach detachment because the eye is the dominant sense organ important aspect of movable type was its ability to reproduce the same text over and over again let's discuss about the electrical age the rise of the global village maclohan insisted that electronic media are retribalizing the human race instant communication has returned us to pre alphabetic oral tradition where sound and touch are more important than sight we have gone back to the future to become a village unlike any other previous village we are now a global village electronic media brings us in touch with everyone everywhere instantaneously whereas the book extended the eye electronic circuitry extend the central nervous system the digital age rewiring the global village with that said there is no doubt that the introduction of digital technology is altering the electronic environment the mass age of electronic media is becoming increasingly personalized instead of one unified electronic tribe we have a growing number of digital tribes forming around the most specialized idea belief values interests and fetishes instead of mass consciousness which macmahon viewed rather favorably we have the emergence of tribal welfare mentality and now we come to the last uh, topic of this class that is stuart hall and cultural studies cultural studies is an approach to studying culture that lies at the intersection between the social sciences most notably society and the humanities especially as a non disciplinary study cultural studies draw them diverse fields and academic traditions though the roots of areas of history are diverse we can say that cultural studies is a critical perspective that focuses on the political implications of mass culture there are four ideas that are central to cultural studies harmony science and semiotics sorry hegemony science and semiotics representation and discourse and meaning and struggle now we discuss out firstly on hegemony maria wester in 2002 defines hegemony as having a pre ponderant influence or authority though the definition is short it is important hegemony is defined as pre ponderant or dominant influence rather than a single ruling ideology the idea of hegemony recognizes that there are many possible cultures that vary by time and circumstances this idea of hegemony allows us to see ideology as active it opens the door for us to see cultures in conflict vying for position and influence it opens the door for us to see cultures in conflict vying culture is an industrial society never a homogeneous structure rather it is a multifaceted reflecting different methods of coping with peculiar constellations of social and material life experiences though these cultures are differently ranked according to the social group to which they are related and their principal method through which dominant groups elicit the 
subordinates cooperation is by co-opting the lived experiences it works primarily by inserting the subordinates class into the key institutions and structures which support the power and social authority of the dominant order it is above all in these structures that relations that a subordinate class lives is subordination because the oppressed must work and have much of their existence within organizations and structures is controlled by the elite they must adapt to the expectations and ideas of the hegemonic culture next is science and semiotics one of the chief methods that cultural studies use to understand the culture is semiotics semiotics is simply the study of science or worlds roland barthes explains that cultural science symbols and images can have both denotative and connotative functions denotative functions are the direct meanings of a sign they are the kind of thing you can look up in an ordinary dictionary yet cultural signs and images can also have secondary or connotative meanings these meanings get attached to the original word and create other wider fields of meaning at times these wider fields of meaning can act like myths creating hidden meanings behind the more apparent next is representation and discourse as we have noted one of hall's principal concern is with representation hall sees representation as an act of reconstruction rather than reflection almost every image is a technologically advanced society is created for a reason with same with some other or larger purposes in mind there is then the surface appearance or denotative meaning of the image but there is also a deeper myth like connotation there as well next is meaning and struggle generally the dominant definition of a word is taken for grantedness is achieved as powerful individuals or groups give credibility to the association of sign and meaning and as the association is repeated by others over time as in the media these repeated meanings become part of the sedimented memory of the collective and form a reservoir of themes and premises from which participants may draw one of the things we mean when we say that the meanings are sedimented is that they are taken for granted we use them without even thinking this taken for grantedness is part of what makes signs symbols and culture in general ideological to summarize the above stuart hall and the school of cultural studies take the critical look at culture semiotics is the study of science and cultural history the approaches all culture as if it is functions in much the same way as language with meaning produced through difference linearity and syntagmatic syntagmatic and associative relations signs also have denotative and connotative meanings with connotative meanings forming second order meaning systems that operate much like myths hall also calls our attention to the ideas of discourse and representation cultural images and signs do not simply represent they reconstruct the ideologies and practices of those responsible for producing the images discourse are ways of representative knowledge and practices discourses are ways of talking about a acting towards an idea or group of people that define the group or idea in its totality the insidious nature of discourse is revealed in that to talk or act towards the idea or group at all requires a person to act as if the discourse was true hall and cultural strategies also tell us that culture isn't singular there are many cultures present in the past industry society these cultures vie for hegemony or power generally speaking cultures associated with the economic or political elite will be more powerful as they control the cultural producing organizations yet even they are in competition and must create an alliance in order to have hegemonic effects 
Hegemonic culture is generally accepted by the masses because of it co-opts certain elements of their culture and this uh, thus appears as if it embraces all. The masses also tend to accept the hegemonic culture because they must work and live in the through in and through organizations that are controlled by elite. The masses thus must buy into the elite culture to some degree in order to survive. If left unchallenged, hegemonic culture functions as ideology and oppression is taken for granted and seen as normal. Cultural change comes through challenging these taken for granted assumptions and talking back or changing the associative meanings of words through inversion or metonymic mechanisms. With this come to end of this class and uh, uh, anything uh, everyone's actions are different so i will request you to see the view file and read the things which are not understood by this uh, by my pronunciation thank you good day jayant